to. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome once again to our weekly media briefing and public health update with Montgomery County Executive Mark Elrich. I'm Lorna Vajoli, Hispanic Public Information Officer, and joining us today is Dr. Keisha Davis, the County's Health Officer, as well as Mr. Sean O'Donnell, who's the Acting Deputy Chief of Public Health Services. Of course, Dr. Earl Stoddard, Assistant Chief Administrative Officer, is also here, and we have two special guests today. Melvin Cawthon, who is the Manager of STD and HIV Services for HHS, as well as Dr. Christopher Rogers, Acting Chief of Public Health Services. Thank you everybody for joining us, members of the media. This meeting is being recorded and during the Q&A portion of this presentation, please remember to raise your hand right here so that we can call on you. And with that, welcome Mr. County Executive. Good afternoon. Hello everybody and thank you for joining us again today. Um, today is World, World AIDS Day and is this Friday actually, and we'll be hosting our annual World AIDS Day Solidarity for Health Equity Breakfast. And it happens from nine to 11 a.m. at the Silver Spring Civic Building on December 1st um, on World AIDS Day. And I hope you consider attending and covering this event. Um, it's been 42 years since doctors identified the first cases of what they termed at the time gay-related immune deficiency in 1981. Uh, this disease turns out to be anything but. This was a virus that was stigmatized at its origins by being directly connected to the oppressed and marginalized LGB LGBTQ plus community. It was blatantly ignored and not even cared about by President Reagan's federal government, which often didn't care about social issues. That's not exactly a surprise. Um, even popular TV evangelists would cite that this virus was God's punishment for homosexual behavior. I remember how significant and scary this virus was for many years. Um, I lost a friend, I lost multiple friends early on to AIDS, and I remember all too well the sense of dread and foreboding I felt when I learned that a friend had tested positive. The friends I lost are among the millions of people who could have likely been saved. The virus had been treated seriously from the beginning, as it should have been. It's a good thing we've made progress, but it's a little bittersweet that it took this long. Today, we have an entire generation of sexually active individuals who do not see HIV AIDS as the death sentence that it used to be. And that's good, but we have to re remember that we can't forget about AIDS either. It's still here. And it can greatly impact an individual's health as well, as well as their healthcare costs. There are more than 3,500 people at last count here in Montgomery County living with HIV. And the county's rate of infection is 445 out of every 100,000 people a high mark compared to AIDS in some counties nationally, but in surrounding areas like DC and Prince George's County, the rate of infection is more than twice as high. We must continue to focus and discuss and do community engagement regarding HIV AIDS prevention and awareness. And just a few months ago, the county added the Sexual Health and Wellness Center to the Upcounty Regional Service Center in Germantown. It provides free HIV rapid testing to anyone regardless of residency. The county also offers HIV testing at the Dennis Avenue Healthcare Center location in Silver Spring. HIV AIDS is a key health equity issue and we're seeing a disproportionate impact on black women in Montgomery County. Black women account for more than 80% of those living with HIV and diagnosed with HIV over the past five years. I'm glad that the county's African-American health program, DHHS, DHHS's sexual health and wellness services and partners like Montgomery County Alliance chapter of Delta Sigma Theta a Sorority have partnered to educate and empower those impacted on how they live safely with the disease. That's why testing is encouraged, even among people who might not think they're at high risk. There's also a medication available that reduces the risk of transmission. Please encourage friends and family to learn the facts about HIV and how patients can still live long, healthy lives with successful treatment. At this time, I'd like to invite Melvin Cawthon, manager of STD and HIV service, to say a few words about the county's progress to end the HIV epidemic by 2030. So, Dr. Cawthon. Well, thank you, Mr. Bond Executive. I wanted to ask Dr. Rogers before I begin if he'd like to say a few words. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cawthon. Thank you, County Executive, for 
um, making this a focus uh, on today's press briefing. Um, uh, the County Public Health Services and DHHS offers our HIV, STI, sexual health and wellness programs um, as a um, safety net programming clinic for our county residents who are uninsured and underinsured. Um, our HIV, STI, sexual health and wellness program offers HIV and STI testing, treatment, and other support services um, as the county executive stated across two locations uh, throughout the county. Uh, we also, on behalf of the department, we wanna invite the community out to participate in the third annual Solidarity for Health Equity Breakfast, um, as mentioned, which is in honor of the World AIDS Day on this uh, Friday, December the 1st at 9 a.m. in the Silver Spring Civic building in partnership with the Delta Sigma Theater sorority. Um, as mentioned, Montgomery County DHHS is a part of the Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiative um, after having been named a priority jurisdiction in 2019. Now, this effort is a bold whole of society initiative coordinated by the United States Department of Health and Human Services and in partnership with Maryland Department of Health and other community-based organizations and healthcare providers who all come together to address this important health issue uh, within our community. And so now I'll turn it over to Melvin Cawthon who can talk more about the specifics on this initiatives and the progress that the county is making. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. I'm going to repeat a few of the facts that you just mentioned, um, but I want to study some of others. Um, again, I'm Melvin Cawthon, and I'm the administrator of the county's HIV, STI, sexual health, and a wellness program. We are the county's safety next plan because Dr. Rogers just mentioned for HIV positive adult residents in the county who are uninsured and underinsured. We provide services at two locations. Our main location is at the Dennis Avenue Health Center in Silver Spring, and we provide HIV and STI testing and treatment, medical case management, Helping notification services, HIV dental treatment, and other support services. We have been also opened a new clinic, as Dr. Rogers mentioned, in Germantown at the Up County Regional Service Center, where we offer HIV testing uh, and, treat and STI treatment and partner notification services. Now, looking at recent rates of infection in the county, from 2019 to 2022, we have seen a steady decline in HIV infection. And uh, the numbers have gone from 167 to 107. When looking at our STI rates in 2020 to 2022, chlamydia has seen a 7% decrease in infection and gonorrhea is down 12%. Now, what we have seen an increase is in our syphilis cases from 2021 to 2023. Those numbers have gone up. If you look at uh, prevention, Look at the numbers for PrEP. As Dr. Rogers mentioned, PrEP is the medication that helps to prevent HIV. In our Silver Spring Clinic from 2021 to present, we have seen more than 100% increase in the number of people signing up uh, for PrEP. Now, as Dr. Rogers also mentioned, Montgomery County is part of the Indian HIV Epidemic Initiative having been named one of the 48 priority jurisdictions where uh, of Montgomery County, along with 47 other counties across the United States, make up more than 50% of new HIV infections. Now, participating in the initiative has provided the county with resources to update our HIV and STI testing protocol, which has allowed us to increase testing and treatment We've also created the first sexual health and awareness campaign, Do It For You. We've created an outreach team that is involved in community engagement. And finally, it's enabled us to create two signature events. The first being Pride in the Plaza, which is a Pride and Sexual Health Wellness Resource Fair held the last Sunday in June uh, every year at Veterans Plaza in Silver Spring. The second signature event is happening this Friday, World AIDS Day, December 1st. We will be hosting our annual World AIDS Day Solidarity Breakfast in partnership with the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. 
It's also being held in Silver Spring Veterans Plaza as a Silver Spring Civic Center. A one last announcement on December 8th, we're having a dinner and social event called a December to Remember. It is open to people living with AIDS and their, sorry, living with HIV and their loved ones. And that's being held at the Dennis Avenue Health Center in Silver Spring at six o'clock. Thank you very much, Mr. Coffin and Dr. Rogers, members of the media. Any questions for any of these two officials uh, regarding the county's efforts on HIV, AIDS, and STI? Please raise your hand if you have any questions for Mr. Coffin or Dr. Rogers regarding this topic. Any questions? No questions from the media? Guess not. Going once, twice. All right, gentlemen, thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. No questions from members of the media. You can remain on this event or you can drop off if you need to go. Thanks for joining us. Mr. Khan, Executive. So thank you guys for being on. And I just wanna also commend uh, Adamune, which is a Rockville-based company that's owned by American Gene Technologies. They were recently profiled in MoCo 360 uh, for their work um, in attempting to develop a cure for AIDS. And if their advanced therapy can be developed here, it'll certainly reduce the impact in, of AIDS on our community, as well as nationally and internationally. And it's the kind of uh, the drug discovery and advancements that I'm proud of um, that were being worked on here in Montgomery County within our life sciences industry. We've got an amazing industry here and they do a lot of incredible work. And hopefully um, we'll be doing more profiling with some of the work people do as we go forward. Um, next on the agenda is we're gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, public health approach to youth crime and drug issues. So I want to respond to some alarming statistics that were shared with members of the council today through the Joint Economic Development, Health and Human Services and Public Safety Committees. Um, data from the Montgomery County Police Department shows a spike in violent crimes among school-aged children, 17 or younger. We have seen a more than 200% increase in victims of crime, 215 reported in in FY22, up to 679 in FY23. And the percent of arrested juveniles rose more than 300% from 92 to 395. This is an issue for our entire county with dozens of juvenile victims of crime spread across Aspen Hill, Germantown, Gaithersburg, Wheaton, Silver Spring. Not only, co not coincidentally, we've seen the consistent issues with youth drug overdose or drug use over the last calendar year. Montgomery County Fire and Rescue statistics show an average of eight overdoses per month among 14 to 18 year olds with a high of 16 overdoses last April. To address this, I've asked behavioral health leaders with the county's health department and human services to develop a plan that will get at the root of the social issues that feed into youth violence. These are things like substance abuse and mental health issues that can help contribute to criminal activity. But we can't continue to ignore the role of generational poverty and its impact on the health of young people. I mean, too often, you know, we talk about schools as if, um, you know, what is happening there and, you know, why, why is this problem persisting? And, you know, we don't talk enough about what the impact is of poverty on learning and what the impact of not being successful at learning is on a child's sense of self-worth and their sense of what their future is gonna be. To grow up feeling and believing that the doors to escaping poverty are closed because of who you are and to confront the reality that their, their own personal storyline mirrors the storyline of generations before them can be depressing and discouraging to young people. Now this is gonna require efforts outside of our normal toolbox, but social conditions today are far from normal. So going beyond normal is something we're gonna to have to do. We're using the data we've collected to develop a public health approach and action plan to improve outcomes. This includes providing outreach, giving more families access to our community partners and wraparound services. I don't wanna wait months to develop something that puts our focus solely on summer initiatives like we typically see. So this is an urgent need and we have to help prevent more families 
from being impacted by violence and drug use today. And this is a reason that I've asked our public health efforts address, um, increasingly address the social determinants of these problems. I'd like to turn this over to our public health officer, Dr. Keisha Davis, to explain more about how building a cohesive plan through public health can help us address these issues. So Dr. Davis. Thank you, thank you, County Executive. I just came this morning from a briefing council, as was mentioned, on the disturbing rise that we've seen in um, uh, youth violence and victimization. I do wanna make sure that we reframe often in the conversation around um, youth violence, it's talked about what kids are doing. And I also wanna make sure that part of that conversation is what is being done to kids. Uh, when we think about um, youth violence and youth harm, youth are much more likely to be the victim of crime than they are to be the perpetrator. And so how we um, understand that and look at that data and recognize that um, kids who witness violence are more likely to be perpetrators of violence. And so really taking a system-wide approach to, um, to violence. What we've seen is that um, we have seen this increase um, in uh, youth crime activity, and we have also seen an increase in youth um, overdose and use of opioids and fentanyl. And I wanna also be clear though, that while those increases may have happened at the same time, they are not necessarily the same group of people, um, but they are a symptom or uh, a suggestion of a bigger problem that really goes back to mental health and behavioral health and resources. Um, and to focus just on gun violence and violent activity is missing the broader picture around youth mental health, uh, thinking about suicide and trauma and things that have experienced. And so really in looking at this issue, we are taking a public health system-wide approach um, and really focusing on the coordination and collaboration across county government. We are working closely with uh, MCPS, the police department, fire and rescue, the rec department, state's attorney's office, but also with our community partners like Collaboration Council and Identity and many of the other community-based organizations that are really uh, doing this work on the ground. And while we know that a lot of efforts have been done, um, the, the uh, call for alarm started last year and there were a lot of investments that were made um, throughout the year, over the summer and even continuing now, what we know that we also need in addition to uh, the resources is really the coordination and collaboration and uh, wrapping around our youth. Youth are a student for part of the day, but they are also part of families and part of communities. And so how we think about um, wrapping around not just that student or that youth as an individual, but thinking about how we are supporting their family um, and how we are uh, supporting the community and the context in which they live really goes into that public health approach. Um, at the table today, presenting to council was myself and Dr. Kapunin along with the police chief. Um, but it is really important that we think about physicians as being the ones who are helping to lead this initiative um, because at the end of the day, violence is a social determinant of health. Um, and so how we think about um, the communities and how we build community, uh, strong communities um, ultimately impacts the health, not just of the youth, but everyone that is around them. When we look at our community health needs assessment that was released earlier this year, uh, which one of the things that was identified as an important uh, protective factor is low crime and safe neighborhoods. And so the more that we can do to help promote low crime and safe neighborhoods, it helps the, the, the health of our youth and again, the, the communities that in which they live. Um, some of the things that will be coming out of this um, initiative are really looking at short, medium, and long-term strategies. So as the county executive mentioned, we wanna be looking at what's, what's happening right now. We wanna be setting ourselves up for um, strong protective activities for the summer, but we also wanna be thinking about what are those things that we need to be doing now that are gonna help our youth three to five years from now. We have our, you know, our high school students, that's often who we think about, but those middle school age kids, those elementary age kids, even those early childhood age kids, we know that when we invest in early childhood education and when we invest in families at those young ages, that pays dividends uh, later on. And so really making sure that we are taking that approach to supporting family, supporting youth um, in these initiatives. It, we recognize that it's not enough. We heard some stories today of just um, 
and continue to hear stories from families about the challenges that they have, challenges with accessing the system, challenges with getting to resources when they need it. When folks call and are in crisis, it's hard to hear, we'll get back to you in an hour or a few hours. And so we recognize that those are systems that we need to work on um, and are increasing the focus on really that collaboration and coordination um, so that someone, so that kids are not slipping through the cracks. Um, lots that I could go on here, but but happy to take questions about the about the efforts. Thank you, Dr. Davis, members of the media. Any questions right now? We'll take questions out regarding youth overdoses and crime activity from uh, Dr. Davis. Raise your hand, and uh, we'll call on you. Any questions for Dr. Davis regarding this topic? No questions, but Dr. Davis, you will remain on the call. You will remain here. Okay, we move forward, Mr. County Executive, maybe toward the end of uh, the presentation, they'll have questions for you, Dr. Kate Davis. Uh, thank you, Dr. Davis, for sharing your report with the County Council earlier and here with me for this media briefing. And I think it's important to share with families all the efforts we're making to help address these overdose and violence issues. I think part of this is giving families the tools themselves to help deal with some of these issues, which a lot of people don't have. Um, so this really does require an all-community effort. Um, next, we're going to discuss, you know, last week, we officially launched our first responder drone pilot program, and we talked about it a little bit. And we've already had two success stories to share. Uh, we had a 911 call come in from a retail store along George Avenue that's experienced more than a dozen recent shoplifting robberies. Uh, a drone was called and the drone was able to track a man leaving the store and boarding a bus. With that information, police were able to stop the bus and make an arrest. That investigation could close several shoplifting cases and help bring relief to store employees and business owners in Silver Spring. Another call for help came from police detectives along Eastern Avenue and Kennett Street who witnessed some cars being broken into. They lost sight of the suspect around East West Highway, but a drone was able to arrive within 30 seconds and used infrared track technology to track their body heat. Two men were arrested and both were caught with loaded weapons. These are two examples of many different ways drones can be used to assist police when patrol officers can't make it to the scene fast enough. I'm glad to see these tools are being used effectively and I hope the word spreads that our drones are at work catching criminals and protecting our community. This is a pilot program right now in Silver Spring and Wheaton, but if it continues to be successful, you will see this drone program extend, expanded elsewhere in the county. Um, earlier this morning, I helped introduce the first phase of the Great Seneca Transit Network. And we were there to draw attention to new dedicated bus lanes that are being marked for our pink and lime lines between universities of Shady Grove and the Shady Grove Metro Station. And these improvements are gonna continue through the winter and spring with an expected start date of next summer. New quarter for Ride On Extra will bring uh, connections to our Life Sciences Center off Darnstone Road, medical offices surrounding Adventist Healthcare, Shady Grove and shopping centers like Rio. Dedicating traffic lanes for bus use will enable signal priority for bus riders so that they can reach their destination faster, a little more than Half of the funding, $26 million for this phase of the project is coming from the state. And it shows how important state lawmakers believe this investment is. And I wanna thank the Montgomery delegation uh, for their support. This bus line or this series of bus routes are really being put in place to begin the first installment of um, implementing what was supposed to be the, um, the Quarter Cities Transit Way, which the Hogan administration pulled the plug on in 2019. Um, so we're putting back into place um, transit connections first between the Shady Grove Metro and the life sciences area to help um, make connections to all the jobs up there, make it easier to get to the Metro, uh, make it possible for employees in the down county to take the Metro up to Shady Grove and take a quick bus into their workplaces. So we think this is important. It's also important for life sciences because one of the conditions of allowing additional growth up there was to provide transit capacity to deal with some of the traffic issues. And this provides the transit capacity that enables us to go forward with these developments. 
So we're excited about this and we think it's going to make a difference. Um, and eventually um, it will wind up going up 355 all the way to Clarksburg as part of the 355 line. So there are more connections to come. Uh, that will be a little bit further out, um, but we're going to be expanding the immediate network around um, around the center up there, Life Sciences Center, over the next year or so. So stay tuned. More good news coming. Uh, the ride-on lines are going to operate with new zero emission buses. When the buses come in, they're going to start with our usual buses, but within the year, we should have the new buses. I think by 2075, we'll have a large, not 2075, 2025, we'll have a large number of new buses that we'll be introducing to our fleet that are electric. And these buses have free Wi-Fi and they have charging ports. Uh, we want to make it easier for everyone to choose bus ridership as an alternative to driving, and it's going to help our environment, business community, and our residents. Uh, Friday is also Rosa Parks Day, and this is something we celebrate in Montgomery County every year. It's about honoring the brave act to stand up to racism that Ms. Parks was a part of. Um, she was one of many people that defy the short-sighted, bigoted laws on the books that dehumanize Black Americans. Um, this has long been part of our history. Uh, laws that segregated schools, separated water fountains, let to unfair housing would eventually be abolished, but not before people had to stand up and insist that these laws be changed. They were not abolished because people suddenly became enlightened. They were abolished because people started standing up and saying, we're not gonna put up with this anymore. And I think that's an important lesson. It was uh, the civil rights movement is really a tribute to what happens when people say enough is enough. And uh, I still am a believer that we have a long way to go. Uh, we, we like to talk about the landmark civil rights legislation that was passed in the 60s. And I like to remind people that actually in terms of the real world, the people experience every day it didn't change very much. Didn't get rid of slum housing, didn't do anything about education, didn't do anything about job training, didn't improve access to health care. There's a long list of things that need to be done to change the impact of racism. And that Civil Rights Act did virtually none of them. And that's the work that's been left to us, is to start filling in the real things that have to happen if we expect to see any change. And you know, we go back earlier to discussion about you know kids and everything. If kids grow up thinking they got no place in the world and they're not gonna go forward, it is really hard to inspire them to stay in school and it's really hard to inspire them to work hard. And if the American ethic is, if you work hard, you succeed, the experience of the black community in this country is anything but that. They work some of the hardest, lowest paid jobs in this country and we're not able to move up. And I'm sure as Dr. Davis could confirm, if you look at every single social determinant of health, the black community sits at the bottom of it. So. We can pat ourselves on the back for the civil rights legislation. We need to look ourselves in the face and figure out what we're gonna to do to deal with this problem in a more real way going forward. Uh, finally, um, we're not gonna be um, doing the usual detailed weekly COVID-19 update. I think uh, we all realize that it's pretty much become a repeat story. And so we don't need to go through all the charts and graphs. Moving forward, unless there's a reason to draw attention to a community concern, uh, we'll stay with a very abbreviated version of this. Given the fact we haven't had a variant breakthrough since the end of the summer, this seemed like a good time to focus on other topics during the media briefing. But if you have a question that's COVID-19 related, uh, feel free to ask and we'll address it. Um, at least this time, I'd like to open up to any questions you have. But I want to say that the takeaway from COVID this week, which is about what you need to know is we still have a relative, relatively low rate of deaths at the county and state level. We have a low rate of hospitalizations at both levels. There's a new variant, which is a common occurrence. New, if you look at our charts every week and you actually paid attention to all the letter names, you would have noticed that the letter names change not infrequently and some drop off and new ones are added. Uh, there's a new variant that's, um, it is infectious, but the cases are less serious than they were at the height of the pandemic, which is why we're not doing anything dramatic at this moment about the new variant. This has been typical pattern. Hopefully this remains the typical pattern, but we wanna make sure you remain informed about what's out there, just so that you're not surprised if there's a change, we can give you 
uh, give you the information when we know it's beginning to happen. Hopefully we won't do that. We'll just tell you good news every week. But the news is what the news is. Anyway, thank you all very much. And uh, we're going to stop for media questions now. Thank you, Mr. Connick. Second, Dr. Stoddard, do you have any uh, remarks today or no? No, we can take questions. So let's open it up for uh, questions. Uh, members of the media, raise your hand if you have any uh, general questions for the county executive and uh, the other officials. <clears throat> any questions? Say your hand. No questions? All righty then, I guess we're done for today. Thank you everybody for joining us. Stay safe. We'll see you again next time. Good afternoon, Mr. County Executive. Thank you all. Bye.